Hello and welcome to chapter 7.4 from Stevens' Introduction to Statistics, the Think and Do book. In this chapter, we're going to estimate a population mean from a sample mean using a confidence interval. And in this particular case, we will assume that sigma, the population standard deviation, is not known. And that's probably going to be the case. The reason that's in there and in parentheses is because if you go back to chapter 7.2, we did the same situation. We estimated a population mean from sample mean, but we assumed that we knew sigma. And back then I commented on how that is unlikely. And indeed, that is unlikely to be the case. So it's very important that we do this chapter because this is the more um, real-life situation where you won't know the population standard deviation. I mean, let's face it, if, if you're trying to estimate the population mean, it's it would be very unusual for you to not know that and somehow know the population standard deviation. So this is the more realistic of the two chapters. Um, okay, but it does it does involve using a new table. And I'm going to have to open that up. Oh, wait, no, no. I have it. Okay, so... 7.2, let's get rid of that. Discard. Okay, so let's get started. Chapter 7.4, estimating a population mean. I'm going to put this into full screen mode wide. Okay. So here's the idea. When we did, it, when we did this before, we actually knew the standard deviation. All right, and we did this in chapter 7.2. In this case, we do not know the standard, de the population standard deviation, and that's going to alter our approach um, significantly. The procedure is actually identical, but um, we use a different distribution. And so here's a little background. We have the z distribution, which we've been doing now for a couple of chapters, but there's another distribution called the t distribution, and here's how they're related. Suppose you take samples of size n from a population with mean mu and standard deviation sigma. If you look at the values that we checked out before where we have a all the sample means minus the population mean over the standard deviation divided by the square root of n, that follows a normal distribution. That follows the z distribution that we use so often. And that's um, contingent upon we need sample sizes bigger than 30 and or um, the population has to be normally distributed. So if you don't know whether or not the population is normally distributed, you really need a sample of size um, 30 more. But that, that's, the, that's what we've been doing previously. We, follow, we used a z distribution and we, that's because we somehow knew sigma. Right? But if you look at this collection of values, the sample means minus mu over s. And notice that's the, really the only difference between these two expressions. One has the population standard deviation, the other has the sample. This follows a similar distribution but is not quite normal. right? And it depends on the sample size. And the dis distribution it follows is called the student t distribution or what we'll be calling here as the t distribution. Right? And what's the difference? The only difference is what I circled here. In one case, I'm dividing by sigma divided by root n, and in the other case, I'm dividing by s, the sample standard deviation divided by root n. Um, so what does that mean to us? That means instead of getting our critical values for our margin of error, instead of getting our critical values from the z table, table 2, we're going to use critical values from the t table, which is table 3. And if we can go to the tables for a second just to give you a view on that. I'll get this up to widescreen as well. Uh, so I have my table 2, which is actually two tables. There are two Z tables. My table 3 is the T distribution. There's actually two of these tables too. But it looks like this. And it's, it looks different. It's, the setup is significantly different from, from the Z table. And we'll get into exactly how you read this table in a few minutes. But this is our new table for this chapter when we're estimating means but don't know the population standard deviation. Okay. So we're going to use table 3 instead of table 2. That's the big difference. Um, so here we're going to come up with our 
margin of error. Remember, the critical thing in getting a confidence interval is getting the margin of error. Then you just take the sample mean, subtract the margin of error, add a margin of error, and you actually have your confidence interval. So this margin of error has some terms in there, and we'll be using other terms throughout the, this chapter. So let's go through those. Notation. Mu is the population mean. It is unknown. That's what we're trying to estimate. X bar is the sample mean that we do have. And it also represents the point estimate from mu. S is the sample standard deviation. N is the sample size. The degrees of freedom, now this is a new term for you. The degrees of freedom is just one less than the sample size. So you take your sample size and subtract one. And that gives you your degrees of freedom. The confidence level, when we talk about a confidence interval, is the success rate of the procedure. Also gives us how confident we are in the actual interval. And it'll usually be one of our popular levels of 90, 95, or 99. And just like with the Z distribution, alpha is the combined area in two tails of the um, sample distribution. All right, whenever we did this way back in 7.1, we said, all right, the combined area of the two tails is alpha. That means each tail has alpha over 2 in it. And that's what we call z sub alpha over 2. But in this case, we're going to be talking about a t distribution. So instead of z's, we're going to have t's, right? But we're going to use the same notation, t sub alpha over 2 and negative t sub alpha over 2. And I include this little graph only because it helps describe why we have such a funny looking name for this variable. It's just a name. You don't actually divide it by 2 or anything like that. It's just telling us where it comes from. Okay, so I'm even going to get rid of that. We'll erase that, not to distract anyone. And then the margin of error is very similar to the margin of error from chapter, what, 7.2, where in chapter 7.2, the margin of error was z sub alpha over 2 times sigma over the square root of n. So this is very similar, only now we have a t value instead of a z value, and we use this, the sample standard deviation instead of the population standard deviation. All right. So. Let's get into using this table, right? And by the way, th those pages aren't right. Um, the pages, well, I'll give you the pages in a second, but th they're referenced correctly in your book. This is from the instructor's manual. So using the t-table to obtain critical values, right? Because this is what we want. We, we use the t-table to get these values, the t sub alpha over the 2. So I'm going to go over this, all right? Go back to our t-table. T-table, OK. So what we do is we determine our row from the degrees of freedom. And that equals n minus 1, our sample size minus 1. So suppose we had a sample of size 20, then our degrees of freedom would be 19. And then we find our confidence interval. Our, we, f we find the appropriate column by choosing our confidence level. If we have a 95% confidence level, then that's the column. And we go over this row, down that column, and this value in there, those are the t sub alpha over 2. All right? And there's a little bit more to it, but those are this is where we get the critical values. All right? All right, so let's go back, see what we have so far. So that's how we get t sub alpha over 2. Um, we have similar requirements as we did from chapter 7.2. The sample size, the sample has to be a simple random sample, and we either need a sample size greater than 30 or the population to be normally distributed, or both. Okay. Calculating a confidence interval. So the procedure is identical to actually the last two sections. We determine our critical value. In this case, we're going to use the t-table instead of the z-table. We calculate the margin of error using equation 7.8. And again, that was just e equals t sub alpha over 2 times s over the square root of n. Once we get our margin of error, we take our sample mean, subtract the margin of error, sample mean, add a margin of error, and stick a mu in between representing 
the fact that we don't know what mu is, but we suspect it's between those two values. Write an understandable concluding statement that says, I am whatever percent, that's the confidence level, say 95% confident that the mean, whatever pulse rate for all, this is important, all men is between, and this is where you put in your um, confidence interval limits. The round off rule goes the same as for chapter 7.2. When using raw data, round a one more decimal place than the raw data, just as in calculating the mean. If you only have x bar, use the same number of decimal places as you are given in x bar. Okay, so we'll go back to our sample of 35 men and, that, um, and we're getting their heart rates, right? Okay, so in this case, we're, we're not going to make the um, unlikely assumption that we know the population standard deviation. Instead, we take a sample of 35 men and we get a heart rate of 72.5 beats per minute on average for those 35 men. And the standard deviation from that sample is 10.2, right? And I want you to find the 95% confidence interval estimate for the pulse rate for all men. So I'm going to put in some preliminary info just to get us started. The sample mean, 72.5. The sample standard deviation, Rem notice Sigma is not in there anywhere. Now we just have the sample standard deviation. And realistically, that's, that's what we can expect. We probably wouldn't have sigma. The sample size is 35. And now we need the degrees of freedom when we go back to use that t-table. And the degrees of freedom is just n minus 1. All right, so how do we find the critical value of t? So we need this. We need degrees of freedom and our confidence level, which is 95%, right? So let's go back here. Degrees of freedom is 34. Degrees of freedom. By the way, let's, let's take a look up here. The 95% conf the confidence level is this middle column. I'm going to choose that first because I'm going to scroll down in a second. So I'm going to be in this column, but my degrees of freedom was 34. All right, so I'm in this row. If we continue down this column, it's 2.0. So that's my critical value. That's what this table has. This table only has critical values. So let's go back and put 2.32, 2.032 in there. So here's my formula for the margin of error. Well, there's my critical value, 2.032. Margin of error, let's work on that. We put in the 2.032 for that, for my critical value. My sample standard deviation is 10.2, and my sample size is 35. When you plug all that into your calculator, you get 3.50. That's the margin of error. To get the lower limit, I take the sample mean, subtract a margin of error. Gives me 69.0. To get the upper limit, I add the margin of error, get me 76.0. And so the confidence interval, I take my limits, my lower limit here, my upper limit here, and I stick a mu in between, meaning that that's the estimate on mu. Concluding statement, I am 95% confident that the mean pulse rate for all men, important because this is what I don't know. I don't know what the mean pulse rate for all men is, but my estimate, my 95% estimate, is that the mean pulse rate for all men is between 69.0 and 76.0 beats per minute. Um, so a, a little observation worth noting. When we did this way back in chapter 7.2, we assumed that we knew the population standard deviation. Sigma is 10.2. And we got a confidence interval of 69.1 to 75.9. So when that, when that standard deviation was assumed to come from the population, my confidence interval was just a wee bit smaller but hardly even noticeable. And, and that's going to be true. If, if you're using a sample size bigger than 30, there won't be much difference between the t-table and the z-table. So if you use the wrong table and, 
you're not necessarily you're not allowed to use the wrong table, but if you do use the r wrong table in practice, there's a pretty good chance that um, your solution will not be that different, especially if the sample size is large. Okay, so let's go to your turn. We're going to do the same thing, only now we're going to do the 99% confidence interval. Okay, so everything remains the same. We have our margin of error, same formula, only now our critical value is going to be different because we have a different confidence level. So degrees of freedom is 34. I'm going to look at the 99% confidence level now. So we go up here, 99%, that's this first column, right? Scrolling down, let me get rid of this, rid of this. Degrees of freedom is still 34. So instead of 2.032, which is what I had last time, I'll get 2.728. So my critical value at the higher confidence level got bigger. So there's the 2.728 that I just found. Sample standard deviation, sample size, and I get a margin of error of 4.7. And again, notice, here's my 95% margin of error is 3.5. The 99% margin of error is 4.7. So as I got more confident, my margin of error got bigger. To get the lower, we're actually going to construct the confidence interval now. To get the lower limit, we take the sample mean minus the margin of error, 67.8. To get the upper limit, we take the sample mean, add a margin of error, get 77.2. And then my confidence interval with inequality notation, lower limit on the left, upper limit on the right, with a mu in between, representing that this is our estimate on the population mean that we do not know. And the um, concluding statement, I am 99% confident that the mean pulse rate for all men is between 67.8 and 77.2. Right? So notice the difference here. This was 95% confident. This was 99% confident. As my confidence went up, the size of my interval got bigger. So again, when you look at confidence versus accuracy, as my confidence goes up, my accuracy goes down, meaning my, my interval gets bigger. Right? It's a recurring theme throughout this chapter. Uh, with that, I believe we are done with chapter 7.4. And we just have to tie up some loose ends in 7.5, so I will see you then. Bye.